When the Federal Reserve launched quantitative easing for the first time in 2009, what it really decided to do was monetize government debt and create inflation. Quantitative easing is basically a euphemism for inflation. That's what it is. And in fact, the central banks justified quantitative easing and 0% interest rates because they said these policies were necessary to raise the inflation rate. Inflation was too low. So central banks recognize that these policies were in fact inflationary because they were designed to cure the problem of too low inflation. But that problem didn't exist. All they did was pour gasoline on an inflation fire. Now, inflation didn't really rear its ugly head in a way that became a big problem until last year. And that's because these monetary policies operate with a lag. And what surprised me was the length of that lag. The inflation that we're experiencing now in 2022 really started in 2009, 2010. We haven't even caught up to the inflation we created in 2020. That's coming. But there's all this inflation in the pipeline. Another reason that that inflation did not become as big a problem is because the way the money entered the economy in many cases was through the banking system, through the financial markets. So the prices that were impacted the most by inflation were stock prices, bond prices, real estate prices. And so people didn't mind when inflation was making them richer. Everybody likes a bull market. So when inflation is first entering the economy and the first impact it has is on asset prices, nobody's worried about it. And so the central bankers kept creating it. The other factor was the fraudulent way that governments measure inflation. The increase in consumer prices, the way it's officially measured, is not nearly as great as what is actually experienced by consumers when they're buying goods and services. So if you have an official measure of inflation that says prices are going up by one and a half percent a year, it's possible they're going up by four or five percent a year in reality. And so when the government says, hey, we don't have enough inflation, we got to get that one and a half percent inflation up to two percent. What they're actually doing is getting that five or six percent inflation rate up to 10 percent. Now, where we are today, you've got nations all around the world reporting official inflation rates at 8%, 9%, 10% or more, which means the unofficial actual rate of inflation is probably somewhere between 50 and 20%. So inflation is a enormous problem. Like I just got the other day, my new premium for my homeowner's insurance policy for my house I have in Connecticut, and it was a 38% increase over the prior year. I mean, that, that dwarfs what the government says inflation is. And the reason my insurance premiums went up so much is because they said the cost of replacing the house, if it burns down, has gone up so much. Because of the increase in raw materials and labor costs, it's gonna cost 38% more to rebuild my house than it would have cost to rebuild the same house a year ago. That's what's going on in reality. And I've experienced in my personal life, and so have so many other people that email me, price increases that dwarf what the government claims is the increase. In fact, speaking of housing, in the United States, when we measure consumer prices, we don't use rents, we don't use home prices. Home prices are up something like 30, 40% since uh, the beginning of COVID. Rents are up maybe 20%, but according to the government, they use something like owner's equivalent rent, and that's only up 6%. Well, what is owner's equivalent rent? Doesn't matter, because nobody actually pays it. It's a made up number that the government puts into the CPI so that it can pretend that shelter, which is a third of the CPI, is rising at a much slower rate than it actually is. So now inflation is a huge problem. See, inflation was the government's solution to the problem until inflation has now become the problem. So what is the solution to the inflation problem? There is none, at least none that is politically acceptable. And so inflation is going to get much worse. Forget about what these central bankers and politicians are saying about their commitment to fight inflation, how they're resolute and how they're determined no matter what to bring the inflation rate back down to 2%. That's never gonna happen. We're gonna see 20% inflation 
before we see 2% inflation. Look, we've already seen the first central bank capitulate and wave the right white flag, and that was the Bank of England. The Bank of England was every bit as committed to fighting inflation as the Fed until the inflation fight threatened the financial crisis, and then they cowered out, turned around, and they're back to quantitative easing. They went from quantitative tightening to open-ended quantitative easing. In fact, the Bank of England said, we're going to print as many pounds as we have to. We're going to keep on buying gilts. We're not going to let interest rates go up. They have to let interest rates go up. If you want to fight inflation, you got to let interest rates go up. But you cannot raise interest rates without creating a financial crisis. The financial crisis we had in 2008 was a result of a normalization of interest rates. It wasn't simply a subprime problem. The reason subprime was the problem was because it was debt. People borrowed money and they couldn't pay it back. Why were they able to borrow the money? Because it was cheap. The Fed lowered interest rates to 1%. They created a housing bubble. Housing prices went up. People borrowed money against those inflated property values. They borrowed money with artificially low interest rates. And when interest rates went up, property prices went down. People didn't want to pay their mortgages. You get a financial crisis because now the banks didn't get their money back. They loaned all this money out. They didn't get it back. That was why we had a crisis. Well, today we have much more debt than we had in 2008. We had 0% interest rates for almost 10 years. Think about all the debt that was taken on during those 10 years by not only the government, corporations, private citizens. Do you think they can repay that debt when rates normalize? Of course not. And what happens when rates go up, asset prices come down. It's like the other side of a seesaw. The lower interest rates are, the more expensive stocks are, the more expensive real estate is. But as interest rates go up, those prices come down because it's all a function of interest rates. So if I borrowed a bunch of money to buy a house and now the house goes down, I have no equity and my mortgage payments are up, I'm, I'm mailing in the keys. But the other thing you have to do to fight inflation is to make government spending go down because government spending is the source of that inflation. Governments are running deficits and the central banks are monetizing those deficits by creating inflation. Governments are actually funding themselves through inflation. When you have a budget deficit, you're not getting government for free. Every nickel that the government spends has to be paid for by the citizens. And if they don't pay for it with a tax, then how are they paying for it? Through inflation. So when prices go up, that's the tax that you're paying for all these government programs. And so if the government wants to get rid of inflation, well, then it has to get rid of those programs or it has to raise taxes to finance those programs. And that's not happening. That's not happening anywhere. Nowhere in the world, despite all these governments that claim they want to fight inflation, no government is actually doing it. Nobody is cutting spending. 